Good afternoon, welcome, and a big thank you to over 1,600 people who've registered today for Sherry Fitzgerald's Residential Property Market Webinar. My name is Michael Grehan, and I'm chairman of our residential and countrywide businesses. I'd like to start by offering our sincere condolences to those families so tragically affected by the pandemic, and indeed to pass on our good wishes to those recovering and indeed to those who have already recovered from the virus. I've been advising clients on buying and selling homes for over 30 years, and at this stage, I thought I'd seen it all. What an extraordinary time we are living in. If there is one thing that I have worked by over the years, it is this review the data and use the insights from our research team, as well as listen to our property advisors at the coalface and our consumers to plan for the future. And that's what we are hoping to share with you today. Data, some in-house views, and also to answer some questions you have posed to us. The plan for the next 45 minutes is that we will firstly listen to a 15 minute presentation uh, by my colleague, Marion Finnegan, which we will then follow up with a panel discussion from my colleagues around the country. Introducing Marion, uh, who is our Managing Director um, and indeed our former uh, Chief Economist of our uh, residential business, Marion, one of Ireland's best known property commentators and has a track record of delivering our house view in an impartial way. I'll hand over to Marion now, who will take us through what COVID-19 means for the Irish housing market and looking into the future. Marion. Thank you, Michael, and good afternoon, everybody. What we're hoping to provide you with today is an overview on the performance of the housing market. Now, obviously, um, with a view to the future and predicting the future of residential is particularly challenging at the best of times. So, and even more so in the very unusual circumstances that we're living through at the moment. But what we hope to do is to contextualize where we are today uh, within the context of how the pandemic has impacted the economy in the first, uh, first instance, and then look at how the residential market was performing prior to the onset of the, of the pandemic, and then look at what the likely outcome is thereafter. So to begin with, I suppose, if you are today listening to this webinar and you're thinking of buying as an owner occupier, as an investor, first time buyer, um, you're buying into a marketplace which is part of an economic performance or economic story. So it is a good idea to stand back and see how Ireland has performed in recent years and how we're conducting ourselves at the moment during this very unusual time. And what's very positive, I suppose, about the economic story so far is that we entered 2020 with a really, really solid economic performance. And we've come out of the global economic crisis in 2012, 2013. And since then, as this chart illustrates really well, we've had a very, very strong economic performance. And we've topped the tables in Europe for many years now in that recovery period as a very solid economic growth story. The chart shows on the right hand side the forecasted performance for 2020 and 2021. Now coming into this we had expected a GDP growth somewhere in the order of three, four, maybe even a little bit more in terms of growth. Unfortunately we're now looking at a contraction for GDP for this year and these are the Department of Finance forecasts which are showing a contraction of a little over 10 percent. But the good side is that we're seeing a relatively quick and, and sustained recovery into 2021 with a good solid uh, recovery, not quite V, but, but close enough to V in terms of a recovery for GDP and indeed personal consumption. And when you're looking at economic data and you're trying to find the most appropriate indicators for the property market, it is obviously growth, but it is equally important to look at the labour market and to look at consumer sentiment. So labour market trends are very important indicators of how uh, demand for property will evolve. So this shows the unemployment rate performance from the recovery period throughout, first of all, the recession through the recovery period and right up to present day. And as you can see, we had a significant improvement in the level of unemployment really by the end of last year, the first quarter of this year, we had reached the holy grail of, of what we term full employment. So uh, unemployment levels were sub 4%, a good, really solid growth in the number of people employed over the last number of years. Unfortunately, we're now in a, in a slightly different marketplace in that we've seen unemployment sharply increase in the last 12 weeks. But thankfully, we are forecasting a significant reduction in that unemployment level by the end of the year. Department of Finance are suggesting it will be just under 14 percent. The ESRI are slightly more optimistic. I think it could be closer to 11 um, or even a little bit lower in terms of percentage. So a good, solid outturn 
in the coming months as we move out of lockdown, as shops open up, businesses re-emerge and, and the economy starts to function again. This graph I think is equally important. It looks at consumer sentiments and it takes a view of how consumers are feeling during different stages of economic performance. Uh, we've had a good solid period of a content consumer in recent years and we've seen a sharp drop in consumer sentiment in April and that again not surprising given what had occurred from about the middle of March onwards we saw a significant contraction in consumer sentiment falling down to a level of 42.6 in April but a good solid recovery of um, over 10 decimal points in May and what that shows is consumers beginning to see light at the end of the tunnel so when lockdown occurred, the first thing that happened is we all panicked bought and we, we stocked up the shelves and we saw a spike in withdrawals from the ATM machines. We saw a spike in, in uh, credit card expenditure and then we went into lockdown mode and expenditure contracted. And there was a significant reduction in spending and in withdrawals from, from credit cards. Uh, withdrawals from ATMs. Again, to be expected at that time. But it is a very unusual circumstance that people are capable of saving now because we're not spending, we're not putting petrol in the car, we're not um, going out for meals, we're not going shopping. And that has contained people's expenditure levels, has impacted consumer spending levels for the economy, but has allowed consumers to save. And that is very unique in this circumstance. So it is really a once in a lifetime event. Just to contextualise where we are today relative to previous economic shocks, this graph looks at the last 30 years of data really in terms of, of our economic performance. So the purple block at the bottom refers to GDP growth levels. The red line is Dublin house prices. The blue line which emerges in and out of the graph is um, uh, Irish house prices. And you can see the first thing that's striking I think is that in the beginning period when we have the Celtic Tiger, you see the very exceptional performance of Irish house prices relative to a strong economy. So we overperformed in a strong economy. Then you see the global crash. And again, we significantly underwrote that. So we saw a very significant crash in prices during the global financial crisis. Then we see the recovery period. And now as you look to the right hand side of the graph, you'll see that Irish house prices and Dublin house prices have not performed as strongly as they would have done at different points in the past. And the changing factor here is the macro potential policy rules which came into place in 2015 and they have contained consumers ability to borrow and therefore contained price inflation. So we entered 2020 with a housing market which was good solid housing market. We hadn't seen prices inflate very significantly in the last number of years and as a result of that we've come into this without an overly inflated value in the housing market. And that's particularly important. It co contrasts very well with where we were in 2006, seven and eight. So a very unique position for the housing market for this particular crisis. So how has the Irish residential market been performing in the last couple of years? How did we begin the year and what's the likely outturn for the end of the year indeed into next year? This map, uh, which looks at overall market volumes in terms of houses sold for 2019 and the colour on the map reflects the level of, of um, volumes versus the housing stock. So typically we sold 2.9% of Ireland's housing stock last year, just over 55,000 units, ranging from 1.6% in, in rural locations like Monaghan and um, right up to over 4% in the Eastern Corridor in Kildare and over 3.5% in Dublin. Now, most people, if you're presenting this to them one-on-one, -on -one, will say, well, is that good or bad or how does that perform? And in reality, it's significantly better than we were a couple of years ago, but not as high as you would expect given our economic story. So relatively modest enough in terms of activity levels, given the very significant strength of our economy. So over 55,000 transactions nationwide, 17,300 of which were in Dublin, representing 3.5% of Dublin's housing market. You would probably have expected that 2.9% for the state to be closer to three or three and a half, three and, a half, and the 3.5% for Dublin to be closer to five at this point in our economic cycle for last year. This graph looks at total volumes of transactions and also new home sales. And you'll see the relatively low volume of transactions in the new homes market. And that reflects a couple of things. It reflects the challenges in terms of increasing construction activity in the recovery period. And it also reflects the lower volume of the total stock of construction that actually comes to the market for sale. A lot of the properties that are built from a new homes perspective are built for, for individuals' own purposes, standalone properties. So we actually have a very low volume of new home transactions. So for last year, our sales were up 2% year on year. And in the country overall, total sales up 4%. 
again, a relatively modest performance in a strong economic environment. But bear in mind that last year we were in the onslaught of Brexit. We had two potential Brexit occasions last year. So despite all of those challenges, we had a good economic out outturn and a relatively modest uplift in terms of, of activity levels. And who were the principal purchasers both this year and last year? It's been predominantly owner occupiers. You can see 80% of all our transactions in Ireland through Sherry Fitzgerald were bought by owner occupiers, 84% in Dublin. The red circles there reflect the investor volumes in the marketplace. You can see 13% of transactions in Ireland were bought by private investors buying a house as a potential landlord and 10% of our transactions in Dublin. Again, those two figures quite low given our economic story and given the demand for rental accommodation and they do reflect the very high tax rates which are applicable to private investors and are a worry for the rental market because we should see more investors buying into that sector. So what does the future demand for housing look like? These are CSO forecasts for population growth and they would have seen the population growing from 4.76 million at the time of the last census to 5.5 million by 2031, 1.35 million in Dublin growing to about 1.54 over that forecast period. And that equates to a housing need for typically 35,000 to 36,000 houses a year, 40,000 per year in the short term. Now, have we achieved anything like that? Unfortunately not. So this uh, graph here looks at construction activity over a very long period of time, going back almost 50 years. And you can see the spike in construction activity during the Celtic Tiger, where we built 93,000 units in one year the collapse in construction activity and the very modest upturn. You can see for much of the, the recovery in the last um, seven or eight years, we've been building less than we were building in the 1970s. So it is a very unique period of low construction activity. So we built about 18,000 units in 2018. We built 21,000 or a little over in 2019. And we had forecasted delivery of about 26,000 units for 2020 prior to the lockdown. And that was an important threshold because at the beginning of rebuilding Ireland, we had uh, a forecast from the government of a need to build about 25, 26,000 units. So a long time into that process, five years later, we eventually thought we were going to be achieving that volume. But unfortunately, because sites were locked down for that period, um, we're not going to be able to achieve that type of construction activity. It, you might shut down a site in a day, but it takes several weeks for us to reinstate those sites into full working capacity. So our current estimates are somewhere in the order of 14 to 15,000 units being built this year, which is a big disappointment. That means we're down about 10,000 in terms of construction activity. And if we remember good solid economic growth in the last number of years and a strength of demand for housing that we haven't been able to satisfy at all, and this year we're gonna build even less than we had hoped. We did begin the year relatively positively. We built about 5,000 units in the first quarter. So we did look set to achieve that original target with a nice uplift occurring around the country. But as you can see from the volumes there in that three month period, they weren't rapidly rising. They were improving, but not rapidly rising. And unfortunately that lockdown that occurred in the second quarter has damaged those forecasts. Now this uh, map equally very important. It looks at the quantity of properties advertised for sale on the open market in the beginning of this week. Now we typically do this analysis twice a year in the beginning of January and again in the beginning of the July but because of the year we've had we decided to do a little bit earlier this year. So it shows about one percent of the housing stock available for sale. Now again people will typically ask is that good or bad or how does it how does it compare to what normal should look like? Well first of all to put it in context of history so in 2008-2009 over 10% of the housing stock was typically available for sale in a lot of the locations around the country. Now, as you can see from the map, most locations have less than 1% of the housing stock available. So a very significant contraction, but even more pronounced in the last 12 months. So the current figure of 18,100 is down 22% on the summer of last year. And Dublin 3,700 is down almost 30% on the summer of last year. So lockdown has had a huge impact on the stock available on the market. In other words, the choice available to potential customers. And that will be challenging, not only for people looking to buy, but for the market overall. We have a very, very tight housing stock this summer. In terms of the profile of those properties, this looks at the, per the vendor reason for selling. And as you can see, the, the large chunk there, 32% of our stock were vendors selling their investment properties, landlords getting out of the market. And if you think back to the earlier figures of 10 to 13% of purchasers, 
we have had a problem for the last number of years of the exodus of private landlords out of the marketplace. It's evident in the RTB figures in terms of total stock. And it has been the predominant reason why rents have been rising very dramatically. Demand was growing, population was growing, and rental stock was contracting. And that was what was keeping the upward pressure on rents. Now, it has eased a little bit this spring with some Airbnb properties coming back, but that's likely to be temporary. So we do have a huge challenge around our, our rental market, which hasn't dissipated significantly as a result of this crisis. So what does all this mean for prices? And I think that's the big question on most people's lips. So this graph um, come, looks at the performance of the Irish housing market from a pricing perspective, going back to the beginning of the last, uh, of, of the century really. So we see uh, growth initially very strong during the Celtic Tiger. We see the significant crash in the global financial crisis, and we see a recovery, which is largely quite muted year on year. And what's probably very interesting to note is typically prices are still 25 to maybe even 30 percent down below where they were at the height of the Celtic Tiger. So prices have not regained the values that they had um, during the Celtic Tiger period. For Dublin, slightly more um, uh, volatile in terms of the movement. So very strong price growth in the Celtic Tiger, very significant contrast contraction. Initially, a relatively strong reboost in terms of prices, but then a much more stable growth in prices. Again, from 2015 onwards, that really reflects the macroprudential policy rules and their impact on lending and people's ability to borrow and therefore prices' ability to grow rapidly. So for the year ahead, there's a lot of speculation about where prices are growing and lots of, of, of houses have looked at different options. What I would say is when you're looking at what's going to happen to prices, don't be overly transfixed by June 2020. We do have a solid economic recovery story ahead of us. We do have a latent demand for housing and we don't have a lot of stock available. And all of that needs to be borne in mind when people are looking at price performance. There's no doubt that there's some downsized risk to prices in the immediate term. But I think if we look at a view over the next six, indeed 12 months, there is a very solid stable view for prices. And prices may peter down one or 2%, grow back one or 2%, but the outlook is very stable. That inherent demand, I think, will underwrite price performance um, over the next six to 12 months. So that covers an overview of the housing market. I'm going to hand back to Michael now and he will take through questions with the panels. Thank you, Marion. Uh, that was very insightful and comprehensive as always. Uh, and indeed, thank you to everyone who took the time to submit um, the many questions that we have received. Uh, we've reviewed those questions and my job over the next 30 minutes or so is to distill down the trend lines of those questions for the panel to answer. The three main topics that the panel will address are what do we see in terms of demand and activity, what impact have we seen on supply, and finally, looking to the future. What's our outlook on the future of housing and indeed uh, finance? Introducing our panel, um, Ivan Gain is Managing Director of our New Homes business. Nori McKenzie, based in Galway, is a financial advisor in our mortgage business. Uh, Reno Kelly, based in Dublin and a director of our residential um, business and Des O'Malley coming to us today from Limerick is managing director of our countrywide business and uh, Marion is also staying uh, with us. So focusing on demand and maybe Rena, I'll go to you first as a very experienced property advisor uh, the question on everyone's mind at the moment is what are you seeing in the market at the coalface and who is buying? Thank you Michael. Um, great. Well, look, what we saw at the beginning of the year, and I know Marion has said it earlier, uh, we had a very promising opening quarter with strong demand and um, good positive buyer sentiment. And then with the onset of COVID. So COVID has totally transformed the way we transact business. We've harnessed and, and embraced the virtual world. Um, I think it's amazing how we, we have adapted so quickly, not just agents, but buyers as well. And buyer engagement was, was very good from early on. Um, during the COVID lockdown, during the three months, we've conducted just over 3,000 virtual viewings um, on just under 2,000 houses. Um, last month, Sherry Fitzgerald Nationwide agreed to sales of just under 270 houses. So there is a market, there is a pulse, and whilst activity levels are way off where they should be at this time of the year, they are relatively good given the circumstances and the restrictive nat nature of lockdown. We've seen our fair share of fall-throughs as well. Um, but what's interesting to note is where sales fell through, there were buyers waiting in the wings to re-agree those same sales. 
So what, what was one purchaser's uncertainty, if you like, became another purchaser's opportunity. Where vendors made the decision to take a price adjustment in recognition of the uncertainty as a gesture of goodwill and in an effort to keep a, a sale in line, um, the re-agreed figure percentage-wise was in lower single digits. So I, I think to date prices are holding up reasonably well and that's what we're seeing. Demand will have softened with the change of circumstances as a result of COVID, but supply is also so softened and at an all-time low. There is no disconnect between the supply and the demand. I think what's encouraging to see, I think, is the many signs of positive buyer engagement. We've had 39% increase in our buyer registration to the MySherry Fitz website. We've had a 21% increase in websites from buyers actively looking to purchase property. Of these inquiries, they've come from all over the world, from just under 140 countries. Um, and our largest source of international inquiries come from the UK and the US, where we have seen growth in terms of the hits respectively of 30% and 7% of inquiries. So I think this is really strong. Um, and I think what's important to, to mention here is that what it shows is that our diaspora have been never close to, closer to home virtually. And I think COVID, what it's done is it's allowed people to stop in their tracks and reevaluate what's important. Um, and I've no doubt that family is going to be at the top of that list. And I feel that in the coming months, I think we may see that trend in terms of expats looking at their options to come home and get closer to family. So it's an interesting trend to monitor over the coming months. In terms of who's buying, um, we're, we're seeing a good cross-section of buyers, whether it's first-time buyers, um, people trading up, people trading down, uh, lifestyle relocators, and indeed sort of rights, right sizers. So it's, it's the full uh, complement of, of buyers, and I suppose transaction levels are more weighted at the starter home end of the market, but that's normal. Thank you, Rena. Some very interesting statistics there. Um, Ivan, a similar question to you. I mean, it is great to see that the construction sites are back open um, and people are back building again. But what has the demand been like for new homes? Um, thanks, Michael. I think I'd probably describe it as um, positively resilient. Um, I suppose our, our target market within new homes is, is very predominantly the first time buyer. So typically, you know, my great team are engaging with, with young couples who are potentially in rental accommodation, you know, they're availing of the help to buy, which is, which is up to 20,000 of, of a tax rebate. And I suppose they're looking at very significant savings on, on purchasing over renting, which is typically in the order of 30 to 40%. Um, so last month in May, for example, we had 77 sales, um, really good transactions in the greater Dublin area, but Cork has had had a good period of, of activity and interest as well. And, and just in the last week in particular, Galway and Limerick are seeing a, a pickup in, in, in appetite. Um, so you look, it's, it's, been, it's been pretty encouraging thus far. Very good, Ivan, thank you. And Des, I might go to you. Um, you talk to our, a lot of our colleagues around the country every day and with home working and indeed lifestyle hot topics. Uh, what are you seeing happening around the country? Well, I suppose, you know, when you're talking, to, we've, we've nearly in 100 offices around the country and I, I spend two or three days a week in Dublin and the rest down the country. So, you know, you get a good sense of what's happening. Um, it, it, there's very different, definitely a shift. Um, people are now looking for a home, not an investment. So they're taking a 20 year view. They're not focused as, as uh, Marion suggested on June 2020. There's absolutely no doubt about it. The demand that is there is very motivated. So if we have a property that has been able to get to market and it's been a difficult process to get those properties to market, we're finding the demand is very, very robust. But you've got to put that in context that it's a very limited supply. So, um, you know, it's probably very early days, but we're very, very comfortable where, where we have the pricing right, the demand is very definitely, uh, very definitely coming forward. Um, a very interesting feature, and it's a new feature, is a larger portion of our sales in regional Ireland in the last four or five weeks have been from people relocating from cities in Ireland and cities from around the world, where traditionally you would have had people relocating um, from London or Paris to Dublin. Now we're seeing them, the people relocating from Dublin down, down to, to the rest of Ireland. So this is a new type of demand. It'd be very interesting to see what scale 
um, what scale it'll be, but it's very understandable given what we've gone through over the last three or four, four three months. Um, people are very definitely looking for a new quality of life and a new quality, uh, a new quality of home. And um, Marion mentioned earlier uh, the prices in regional Ireland down the around the country never got as high as Dublin, and the lows never got as low. So I mean. Probably we're seeing we're seeing that the, the, the market will continue, um, but it'll be very interesting to see when it does open up. We do open up fully. What level of supply comes to the market? I think that'll be the interesting question. Thank you, Des. And uh, certainly, the evidence seems to suggest that demand is certainly remaining robust, not just in Dublin and not just in the cities, but right around the country. Noreen, maybe I'll go to you for this one. But you work as a senior financial advisor in our mortgage business. How has activity levels for mortgages held up? Well, Michael, um, we're actually busier than ever. Um, demand for our services has definitely increased. And I suppose what's interesting, um, like a lot of the speakers said there, what we're seeing, the applications we're getting are across all sectors. So it's from your first time buyers to your families that are looking to trade up, um, you know, to people from overseas, switch your mortgages. So it really is across all sectors. I suppose what people have found, well, some people most certainly have found themselves having a bit of time on their hands at the moment. And they're using this time to, you know, gather their paperwork and get themselves ready. And equally, I suppose some people have found themselves in homes that no longer fit their needs. So um, basically, you know, they're looking as well to, to move to trade and they're looking to get themselves ready should an opportunity present itself. Very good. I mean, it's early days in the potential fallout, if you like, from COVID-19. And while we're seeing demand is fairly robust, I mean, I think the big question on a lot of people's minds, well, will the supply be there to meet that demand? Ivan, maybe I'll go to you uh, on this one. And we heard Marion say that we came into, um, you know, this pandemic, if you like, or the effects of the pandemic uh, with the housing shortage. What should the government do to address the housing problem? Yeah, Michael, I mean, I think Marion covered it off quite well. And, you know, really, if you look at the figures and the 21,000 units delivered and probably 14 or 15 to be completed this year, you know, we've lost a third. So it's knocked us back three or four years in terms of where we are at. And um, I think when we look at the housing market and, and delivery of new homes in particular, I think, I think we do need to look at the different component parts of the market. We need to look at different parts of society. So that 35 to 40,000, you know, there's a big requirement for social housing. There's a big requirement for rental housing and um, there's a big requirement for private housing. But I think we need to look at supported ownership and affordable housing in a meaningful way. So, you know, first off, we need a government clearly and we need clear targets for different cohorts. And um, there are models that work uh, in the UK, for example, they, they have a, a uh, an equity loan, a low cost equity loan, which, which enables people to participate in the markets. And I think that supported ownership model should be considered. But there's no silver bullet. There has to be a, a range of different um, options to provide best choice to people. You know, it is concerning. We need decisiveness and we need short, medium and long -term targets for planning. Thank you, Ivan. I mean, Rena, you know, choice is what the market needs. And I'm just wondering on the established market, I mean, how do you see supply developing over the months ahead? Do you have much insight into that? Interesting. I mean, Michael, I think when you bear in mind that we've just come through what are, are normally the three sort of busiest months, if you like, in, in the sort of selling season, when you'd see a huge amount of new listings coming to the market, normally we'd be seen, um, Sherry Fitzgerald would be seen in the order of maybe 500 listings coming to the market. And we have at present, um, when we open up our doors on Monday, we have about 370. So just when you, when you think of this, coupled with what has been a dearth of new listings over the past three months, it's only going to further exacerbate that supply. And I think, yes, you're right. I think it's going to, uh, it's going to impact on the choice on, on what, what is the availability out there for buyers. Um, so yeah, I think it's going to be limited. And I think, yeah, the key takeaway from today's webinar is that it is down to supply and, and lack of supply. And it just looks like the summer is certainly going to be busier than normal. Exactly. It's going to be, yeah, very busy through the summer. Very good. Does uh, the renters, indeed, those let, uh, renting, letting a property, you know, form a significant part of the housing cohort? With the impact uh, COVID-19 has had on Airbnb lettings, how have you seen um, that affect the lettings market in general? Well, the letting market um, can be quite contentious, but in fact, as Ivan and Marion mentioned previously, 
it is a very important plank of the, uh, the housing housing market in Ireland, and um, I think we need some clear thought and leadership, and probably a government um, in the next couple of weeks to 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 to, to focus on looking at at, at, at the levies market as part of the overall market as opposed to a problem. Um, getting back in particular to your question, the Airbnb stock came, came, really came in, um, in a surge at the end of February, March, uh, onto the market in Dublin in particular and to the other cities, but in Dublin in particular. Uh, it did have some effect in the short term, but actually rents held up pretty firm. And the saturation level got 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 taken up pretty quickly over the over the following four to six weeks. So in fact, it does indicate um, there still is an issue in supply. And in fact, I would suggest that it could be the part of the market that's under the most pressure. We continue to see landlords exiting the market, uh, which is an issue, and it's creating further difficulties. Um, we need to be able to give tenants a better choice and there will be a change in the makeup of those tenancies. One interesting um, development over the last couple of weeks is house sharing, which used to be so prevalent for us all coming to Dublin or coming to college, house sharing in a house really has, really has not at all been prevalent in the last couple of weeks. So it'd be interesting to see how, where does this cohort go? Do they start to go back to home, live at home and commute, which I can assure you will only last a certain period of time. So we may be a case that we need to look at a different type of product. One other interesting feature that did emerge was the virtual viewings and the remote technology worked incredibly well for our lettings businesses. Um, I think it'll be definitely a feature of the market going forward. And I also think if we could transfer some of our learnings into the sales business, uh, I think I think it'd be very interesting and it might alleviate some of the some of the pressures there in terms of delays. Thanks, Des. I mean, something we've been saying for quite a while is not necessarily that the house prices are unaffordable, it's more that rents are, are, are unaffordable. Indeed, many of those who have registered for the webinar today are renting, and indeed they're dealing with the banks um, to try and arrange uh, finance and arrange a mortgage. I mean, maybe Noreen, um, you know, how do you have the banks reacted to applicants who have been on the COVID-19 payment? Well, I suppose, uh, Michael, we would, we would see the approach the lenders have taken is very much a common sense approach to this. They're engaging with customers on a case-by-case -case basis in relation to it. Like, obviously, any of the, uh, the approval and principles that are, are in the pipeline have not been impacted by this. But as you move through the process, through to legal loan offer and to drawdown, then the banks at that point are asking for, you know, extra documentation and they're asking the question, has your income been impacted by the COVID crisis? And for those um, who have been impacted by it, um, it's, it's a real case of, you know, they, they're looking for them to have a pay slip and a bank statement to just confirm that they have gone back to their pre-COVID um, level prior to drawdown. Now, I suppose it's interesting just to, or important just to point out that this is in the, con the customer's best interest. So this is a legal requirement under the Consumer Protection Code by the Central Bank of Ireland. And um, so the bank is, ha is legally obliged to ensure that the customer can continue to afford the mortgage repayments. So it is a good thing. I know you've been helping a lot of people out in that regard in terms of navigating that application process that's probably become a little bit more difficult. Absolutely, absolutely. We've been, we've been, you know, in constant contact with all our existing client base, just liaising between them and the banks in that regard. Well done. Keep up the great work. Um, looking to the future, um, Rena, you know, maybe you'd give us your top tips to someone who is on the fence today and maybe considering selling. What are the three things you think that they should know? Thank you, Michael. I think one of the things when we come into this time of the year um, in terms, one of the questions that buyers will ask us is in relation to the seasonality, you know, it's summertime. Normally it it's, gets quieter and the market gets quieter. I would say to you, don't make a decision based on seasonality this year because with the pent up demand um, built up over the last three months, um, I think it's going to be a very busy few months ahead in terms of transactions. So um, if, if you're of a mindset, basically if you're of a mindset to sell and it suits your circumstances, I think this is a good time to launch. 
Furthermore, and, and this is a really important point, it's one thing getting your house ready and, and we all know the staging techniques and all of our agents are happy to advise. However, the really important part is to get your legal pack in order. It's just as important. Make sure you contact your solicitor, make sure you know where your title documents are, be basically be contract ready. So when you find that buyer, you're going to avoid really serious unnecessary delays, which can cause all sorts of difficulties down the road. Brilliant, Rena. Thank you. And Ivan, a similar question for you. If you were advising your brother or indeed your sister um, who's buying a new home, what advice would you give them today? Yeah, Michael. Um, okay, I'll take my brother. Um, my brother's a nurse and, and uh, I suppose he's a real urbanite and a bit of a hipster. But, um, you know, I think, I think I'd say to him, look, you, you need to think long term. You need to think broad. Um, you really need to think where you want to be in three, five and ten years time. And, and really do the research. I mean, we've, we've got a couple of exciting projects coming up right now in, in Newcastle, County Dublin, and in, in Scary. And, 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 you know, for him as a nurse, it's, it's, it's thinking beyond the cities. Um, and as I mentioned, you know, he, he would fall into that kind of cohort of someone who would, re would require or could definitely benefit from sort of the, some of those supported ownership type models. Um, but, I, but I think be, be, be well-versed, well uh, well-researched, um, and, and, and think well into the future. And, and as, as Marion and others have said, let's just not be transfixed by, by this moment in time. Very good. He's a, a good advisor by his side. Um, Des, for those uh, listening and considering a lifestyle move, uh, what should they factor into their research? Well, actually, you know, Michael, we're, we're, we're just looking at what's going on around the country and the change of behaviour. Um, Remote, remote working now is seen as not just possible. In fact, I, you know, a lot of our purchasers see it as an absolute requirement. The change in behavior of them being prepared to commute one, two, one or two days a week, but getting a home further away from, the, from their job is, is now more acceptable. Um, to facilitate this is National Broadband Plan. And I think the, government, or the new government needs to really back it. I think it's important. Um, the, the broadband um, bandwidth is nearly as, a, as an important question as the VR rating now we're finding throughout the country. Um, I would, I would uh, suggest to people that they consider the, the bungalow out into the countryside built about 35, 40 years ago. You have a much bigger square footage, you have a much larger garden, and it looks like we're all going to be spending a bit more time in our own homes. If you think about it, 32% of our population live outside the main cities and towns. And I suppose this crisis has helped maybe to re reverse that historical exodus, uh, exodus towards the cities where people can come back, are, are looking to come back out into the countryside. One other idea we, we've been toying with and we've seen it happen is repurposing some of the existing stock um, that are in our villages and towns. I think Westport's a fantastic example of tra uh, tra transforming old, tired retail premises into homes. I think if you go some way to uh, helping uh, the, the figure that Marion and, and Ivan were suggesting of the, of the 25, 30,000 um, homes needed every year, I think if we look to repurpose some of the homes we have there, or some of the properties we have on those towns, each of those towns and villages have great schools, great road infrastructure, fantastic communities. If you think about it, most places in Ireland are only about an hour, hour and a half from a major city, probably with the exclusion of Donegal. So, you know, these types of locations are very, very, uh, a very real alternative for people. I think it will help rebalance Ireland um, away from the eastern seaboard and help rejuvenate the rest of the country and probably take a bit of pressure off Dublin. Noreen, of the many questions, hundreds of questions we received today, there were many that referred to interest rates and where they were going. Do you have a view on that? And indeed, how to get the best interest rate? Well, obviously, Michael, at the moment, um, interest rates have never been so low um, in Ireland. Um, we're looking at two-year fixed money at the moment at 2.3% and five-year fixed money below 3%. So, I mean, obviously, it's, it's a very low rate environment and I see this to continue. I see us in a very stable interest rate environment at the moment um, with maybe the slight possibility of some downward pressure on rates. I suppose we're lucky in Ireland at the moment that we have seven serious lenders in the marketplace um, who want to lend money. 
And um, we've two new players in the market, two recent joiners to the market who are really anxious to grow market share. So from that point of view, it's really positive for the customer at the moment. So we've spoken a lot about choice today and actually the, the banking market is, is one of them where there's a lot of choice for the customer. And while I have you there, I'm just wondering, um, would you have a view on what enduring changes do you see remaining or changing in how we deal with the banks? Well, I, I definitely believe that digitalization is here to stay. Um, I, I don't think that the, co the consumer is necessarily looking for a digital mortgage, but I do believe they're looking for a digitally assisted mortgage. And I suppose if there's one piece of advice that I could give to um, consumers is get yourself a good mortgage broker not just to get you the best deal that's out there, but just to help you navigate through the whole process. Like obviously, hopefully, um, you know, through increased digitalization, we'll see less paperwork in a mortgage application going forward post the COVID era. Um, and I suppose the, the whole mortgage side of things is something that, you know, we're very strong at here in Cherry Fitzgerald. And I would hope, you know, that, um, you know, our consumers would consider us, but if not, there's loads of choice out there. Thank you very much. We really are coming to the end of our webinar today and thank you to all the, the panellists who contributed. Um, maybe finally, uh, we opened the webinar with Marion's presentation. Maybe Marion, the last word to you. How do you see Ireland uh, five, year from five years from now? Are you optimistic or pessimistic? Um, Michael, I think, first of all, there's a lot of very positives coming out this morning. And I think, while we all need to be a little bit cautious, we're not living in, we're living in very unusual times. So I'm, I'm not going to, to say to, state that I'm, I'm wildly optimistic in the short term, but I do believe that fundamentally we have a good, solid story in Ireland. We have a good, solid economy. We've performed incredibly well. We've been very resilient. We've come out of the crisis incredibly well. In fact, to top the polls in the last couple of years in terms of our economic growth, despite Brexit, and Brexit was a huge factor for Ireland, really shows how resilient our economy is. We've performed very well in the crisis. I think politically, we've shown ourselves to be very astute. We've made the right decisions. We made them early. I think the next phase will be very important for Ireland. We do need, as Ivan has alluded to earlier on, and indeed many of the speakers, we do need to have a long-term plan for housing now. We've had a housing crisis for 20 years, one way or the other, and we really need to get a correct plan in place. We need to build the right quantity of properties. We need to build them in the right location. What Des was mentioning in terms of the dispersal of population is really positive news. We do need to see Ireland's demands being spread out outside the, the core urban centres and for people to be able to enjoy a much higher quality of life. If we get this right, I fundamentally believe it's a very positive story for Ireland. And we'll come out of this stronger and fitter and better able to cope with whatever the world throws at us. So I am cautiously, but I'm definitely um, optimistic. Uh, wonderful to hear. I mean, I just maybe rob a line from uh, that Rena used earlier and looking at even the previous crisis that the country has faced that maybe from a property purchase perspective that people can become overly transfixed by current events. So they really need to look, to look beyond what's happening immediately and to the more uh, medium term. I think there's a lot of information and, and positivity in that regard. We're at the end of our webinar, webinar uh, I might say, but finally we're just saying that we've been operating at Cherry Fitz virtually over the last number of months and we commence, recommence our physical operations in our offices and our viewings and our inspections um, next, next week. So we're available uh, to, to operate in a safe and responsible manner and we look forward to helping everyone on their property journey. Um, this webinar has been recorded and will be available on our website uh, later today. Thank you very much uh, to our panelists uh, and have a enjoyable day. Thank you. <laughs>